It's an experienced North Carolina team that just has a knack for making winning plays, and they do it yet again on Saturday at Boston College. Let's talk about it. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? It's Isaac Shade. We are going live here on Locked on Tar Heels right after North Carolina's 76-66 win over Boston College on Saturday afternoon. I uh, want to welcome in particular you everydayers. It's great to be together. I know a lot of our Discord folks are on here. What's up to all of you? If you're not in the Discord yet, hey, the link to that is in the notes for this. Come join us. We'd love to have you in there as well. Here's what we're going to do. We're just going to get into talking about this game. I'm just going to kind of update you on where things are at. I've got eight specific things I want to talk about, four ad read, four more, and then we're going to get into taking your questions in the comments. So I see the chat is all ready going. Folks, get into the chat. Let me have some questions from you, and I'll make sure to catch several of those at the end uh, of our talk today. It's great to be together, man. I know this is uh, not uh, the blowout we're looking for, but good grief, it's another win. And it means that Carolina is now 7-0 in ACC play. It means that they are 4-0 in true road games. It means that the winning streak is up to eight games, all of which are by double digits. Do you realize that? Carolina has won eight straight games Every one of them has been by at least 10 points. All ACC games have been by at least eight points. The only one that wasn't double digits was the Florida State game. Every, like in the six ACC games that Carolina has played since that Florida State game earlier in December, they've all been double digit wins. I'm telling you, I know it didn't feel like an overwhelming victory, but this Carolina team just figures out how to keep pushing stuff ahead. It is the mark of a veteran and experienced team. Uh, as we start chatting here, oh, Ken Palm just updated, literally just now. Um, and so let me go see where Car Carolina uh, still sitting seventh at Ken Palm, 15th in offensive efficiency and fifth in defensive efficiency. So I'm telling you, I know it feels just like a gritty, like whatever kind of game. But these are the road wins you got to stockpile, particularly in the doldrums of January. So very well done by the Tar Heels. Let's get into talking about several things. Four things, then we'll take a break. All right, number one, this was a find a way kind of game. I love that Carolina just wasn't like, it wasn't flashy, aside from a couple really nice alley-oops. There was the, the dunk from Okonkwo right before halftime. There was the one-handed alley-oop to Harrison Ingram, uh, from both from Elliott Cadeau, by the way. Great stuff there. But really, this was just the game that a tough team wins. And I think that, for me, continues to be a ridiculous mark of this team that they don't care what's going on. They don't care the environment or the circumstance. They have a mission and they're going to get it done. If, you know, Carolina was down six kind of early in the game, but there was no fear. This team just kept plugging away, working to figure out what they needed to do. And they eventually got there. You know, I, I don't know if you felt this way at the end of the first half or, you know, in the back half of the first half, I just kept thinking, Man, it just feels not good. And then I kept remembering, oh, wait, the Tar Heels are winning this basketball game. And in fact, use that 4-0 run to get a halftime lead 34-31. And so it's the kind of thing that when you have a team that, as we've mentioned several times this season, is the fifth most experienced team in all of Division I, man, it just pays dividends. They don't panic. They don't get worried. Um, it felt like most of the second half was played at a four to six point margin, but Carolina just kept executing and that's all you got to do. And I, I was so grateful for their ability to do that for Elliot Cadeau to be able to do that as a freshman on the road for RJ to do it in moments when he needed to. Uh, I love that. We even had like a little flip of roles at one point and it was Armando getting the backdoor assist to, uh, Elliot Cadeau cutting for the layup. You, you love all of those things. And then even down the stretch, Carolina never led by double digits until like the last two minutes or so. I've got it somewhere in my notes. But uh, at the moment when it finally went to double digit lead, it was 
the first time was at 115 left in the game on Seth Trimble's really nice floater in the lane. Seriously, that was the first time Carolina led by double digits. But they were, you know, I, I've had people voice to me some consternation over Carolina going into like kind of slow down mode late in the game like you would do with a, uh, a football team when they've got a lead, just keeping it on the ground and keeping it really vanilla. But Carolina executed those moments really, really well in this game down the stretch. Let me remind you of all of those what happened. So there's uh, about three minutes left. Carolina's up 68-63. They use most of the shot clock. It leads to Cormac Ryan free throws with like three tenths of a second left, 70 to 63. Uh, then uh, BC gets two free throws, but then RJ ran it down to like 201 and just blew by Jaden Zachary layup. Carolina just keeps pushing out. Withers on the next possession contests without fouling. That was really nice. Armando Baycott's ninth rebound, just one rebound shy of a double-double, I should mention. Uh, then the Trimble floater on the other end. Baycott gets his foul. Post makes two of two. Um, but then on the other end, Jalen Withers – or. Um, Jalen Withers gets an offensive rebound, gets to Ryan free throws, and that's the final 76-66. Carolina gets a rebound on the other end. So this veteran team just keeps doing it. Just individual things like that Jalen Withers offensive rebound, Harrison Ingram's three uh, um, in front of Carolina's bench. Those kind of moments is what you see from a team that is veteran and experienced and can find a way. All right, second thing I want to talk about. Uh, and this is all over the chat, and it's been it was all over the uh, Discord just talking about the referees in this game, y'all. This was an absolute foul fest. It felt like the entire game felt like the second half of the 2017 national championship against Gonzaga. You remember that? How just there was no rhythm, there was no pacing, uh, but Carolina just kept doing the things they needed to do, and the same was true here. Um, it, it was, it's kind of weird. Carolina has not been out free throw attempted this season. Um, but Boston college took three more free throws than, than did the Tar Heels, but Carolina was right there. They took 26, made 21 of them. And I'll remind you that they started this game four of eight from the free throw line, meaning they only missed one of their final 18. If I'm doing that quick math, right in my head, but there were just so many fouls called in this game both ways. Thankfully, it evened out a little more in the second half. Um, the Carolina had 26 fouls called on them. Uh, Boston College had 20 fouls called on them. But here's why I want to talk about it, because this was another mark of Carolina being a veteran experienced team and having Coach Davis's trust. For example, Armando Baycott picked up his third foul like two minutes into the second half. You notice that Coach Davis left him in to try to work at getting into a rhythm. And um, until like one of those last few possessions, that that foul on Quentin Post, um, that was when Mondo picked up his fourth foul. So it was a really nice job of navigating the foul trouble. I loved that Coach Davis in the first half when you had two fouls on multiple of the bigs, went ahead and brought in James Aconquo. I know... Um, you know, he missed that one, what would have been kind of wide open dunk. He just couldn't handle the pass. Um, but outside of that, Aconquo did some nice things. We already talked about that dunk he had. He had a block, some other things, had a nice little uh, offensive rebound. And so really, really good job by Carolina of, of dealing with some refs that were less than ideal. I, I will put it more nicely than probably most of you were thinking in your head. But but seriously, this is yet again a mark of a veteran team that's able to navigate that well. Number three um, thing that I want to talk about today is Cormac Ryan. And here's why. This poor guy just can't seem to string together a good three-point shooting game in back-to-back -back games. You know, he's four of seven on Wednesday against Louisville, finishes this one 0 of four. And they were good looks. That, that's the thing. He he had nice looks at three, but just couldn't get it done. But here, we've said this so many times this year about Cormac Ryan. He doesn't let it get him down. He stays engaged and he does all sorts of things. He was the second leading scorer on this team in the game. 14 points, was perfect from the free throw line, six of six. He had three rebounds. He had an assist, a block, and a steal. And his usual brand of like tough-nosed, I'm all in. And how important is that in a game like this where things really started to get chippy kind of uh, five, six minutes into the second half? Um, and it's Cormac Ryan that just is in and going and helping make winning plays for his team, even when he's not doing it from beyond the arc. 
And I know, I know it's important for him to get, uh, to get going from beyond the arc. You know, we talked about that on Friday's show, but I was really, really grateful for the way that he was able to navigate those things and still, um, do some really nice things for his team. The fourth thing I want to talk about is Jalen Withers. Uh, one of the big question marks was how would he follow up his um, North Carolina best game that he had against his former team, Louisville, on Wednesday night? Well, Jay Witt finishes with nine points on three of four shootings, so he can't extend his uh, double-digit scoring streak. Falls just shy of that. And um, you hated it because he got into that, that foul trouble pretty quick in the second or in the, in the first half, excuse me, and was in a good rhythm. He had had a bucket, Trimble three, and then Jalen Withers hit that three and then pretty quickly picked up a second foul right after that. But um, yet again, he came back in the second half, did things. We, we just talked about that offensive rebound. He had had three rebounds in total, but perhaps the most critical thing is that yet again, Jalen Withers, and you know how many, we're going to talk about turnovers here in just a second. Jalen Withers, zero turnovers, people. I'm just telling you, he is just doing so many more things to help win basketball games than he was doing early in the season. He continues to really understand what his role is. He continues to really help this team in so many ways, and it's it's great, and it is what this team needs. All right. I got several more things I want to talk about. First, I just need to stop and tell you though, that this episode of Locked on Tar Heels is brought to you by FanDuel. Thanks for joining us on it. The NFL playoffs kicked off last weekend. They picked back up today, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is really easy to use and they got a bunch of different ways to bet. Same game parlays. They got a new explore tab. They got a parlay hub to help you build some parlays. How about those ACC conference odds for the regular season? You ready for this? Tar Heels minus 165. It keeps growing. Duke at plus 160. Wake and NC State at plus 3,000. Miami at plus 4,000. And it just drops off from there. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right, let's get right back into it. I got four more specific things I want to talk about and then want to go and grab some questions from the chat. So if you got questions about this win for the Tar Heels, please make sure you've dropped them into the chat and we'll get to those in a minute. All right, the next thing we got to get to is turnovers. Y'all, I'm telling you, through the first half of this game, it's like Carolina is averaging 10 and a half turnovers on the season, which is phenomenal. They had nine in the first half. You can't do that and win on the road. Carolina only had 34 points, but yet they shot 52% in the first half on field goals. Why? Because when they, when they held onto the ball and got a shot, they made just north of half of them. But the problem was when you got nine turnovers, you're not able to get as many shots off as you would like to. So my my biggest thing at halftime, I think I tweeted this out, was, hey, look, if Carolina can just simply hang on to the ball in the second half, they're going to win this basketball game. And that's exactly how it turned out. Um, they uh, didn't get a second half turnover until after the under 12 media timeout. And they committed back-to-back -back turnovers like pretty soon after that. But then none down the stretch zero after that and so that that was critical that was very critical to carolina being able to win this game and so you finish with 11 just half a turnover north of your season average you can live with that particularly when you remembered that you had nine of them in the first half and then looking at who the culprits were for those turnovers here's what you need to know nobody had more than two elliot had two ingram had two uh, Jalen Washington had two and a Conquo had two, but nobody else had uh, multiple turnovers and nobody had more than two. So um, spread out there and we can certainly live with that. So nice job taking care of the ball in the second half. That's what you need as you're trying to win on the road. Second thing is we get a little more game specific here and forgive me, I forgot. I wanted to get the, um, the box score up for us so that you could look at it as we're chatting here together this afternoon. All right. So let me get the box score for you. 
Here it is. There you go. You can see the box score there. Um, for those of you watching, I know if you're listening back to this on the audio feed later, um, that you're not able to see that, but that's okay. So um, Carolina rebounding. How about this? Once again, the Tar Heels just keep getting this rebound advantage in this game. They end up out reading, out rebounding Boston College 43 to 28. My goodness, that's plus 15 on the boards. Uh, Carolina's fewest offensive rebounds in a little while. They'd been getting, I think it was 12 in each game um, recently, but they do still get the double digits. Carolina grabbed 10 offensive boards, but only allowed, here's maybe the more important thing on, on the glass, is that Carolina only allowed Boston College five offensive rebounds. So really nice job by the Tar Heels of finishing off defensive possessions with um, with with getting a defensive rebound. And Carolina led the defensive rebounding 33 to 23. And it's a great moment for me to bring up that Harrison Ingram once again gets a double-double, 11 points, 13 rebounds. I think I actually tweeted that he had 11 rebounds, so I'll have to go and uh, make amends and apologies for that. I'm sure people are getting big mad in the Twitter comments because of that. I'm so sorry, uh, Harrison. I didn't mean to, to cut you short there. As I mentioned earlier, Armando was just one rebound shy of a double-double. But, man, critically, here's what's interesting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven Tar Heels had at least – three rebounds. Cormac Ryan had three. RJ Davis had six to, and four assists and just one turn. What a game from RJ. You love to see that. Uh, Baycott and Ingram, we already talked about four rebounds from Seth Trimble, three from Jalen Withers and three from James Aconquo. And um, so really, really good job on the glass by Carolina. They just keep doing what they need to do on the glass to help them win basketball games. Third thing I want to mention here as we are very game specific is the bench. North Carolina, you might recall if you if you think back to the beginning of the game, had a lot of trouble getting scoring. Um the BC went up 4-0. The Carolina's first points was Elliot Cadeau going one of two at the free throw line uh, to make it four to one. But then he had a nice layup right after that. And then things got going. As Carolina was struggling to score, it was the bench right out of the gate that helped do it. Um, Jalen Withers had a jumper, and then Seth Trimble's three, and then Jalen Withers three, and then Carolina was just off and running a bit. It was the bench that really helped get it going. Um, and yet again, this is a game where Carolina gets over that 13-point um bench scoring. And so now Carolina has gotten at least 13 points from their bench in 15 games this season. That means they've already uh, done it more than the team did in the entirety of last season. Last season, the bench scored 13 or more points 14 times. They've now done it 15 times this year. This team is getting uh, contributions from all over the place. And I asked on Friday show, I said, I'd like to see um, Carolina have more diversity of bench scoring because I think, you know, we talked about it was um, 13 of the 15 or 15 of the 17 bench points came from Jalen Withers on Wednesday night and two points from Paxson Wojcik. In this one, Carolina got bench points, none from Zayden High, six from Seth Tremble. None from Wojcik, none from Washington, who had the, the foul troubles. Nine from Jalen Withers and two from James Aconco. So a little more spread out than Wednesday night. But um, it's nice when you got all five starters scoring at least eight points and then the bench contributing 17 from three different guys. You'll take that. All right, let's talk the fourth specific game kind of thing I want to mention is defense. This is one of the, the energy defense uh, bench and rebounding we've been looking at. The defense does it yet again, holding Boston College um, to 19 of 55 from the floor. That's 34 and a half percent. And yet another game of uh, causing a team to struggle from beyond the arc. Boston College shot just three of 17, 17.6 percent you can very much live with that Quentin Post got 19 you know he's, he's going to be the guy that scores but their second leading scorer Harris Jr. only had five points one of 11 from the field 0 of five from three so Carolina's defense continues to do it Boston College scores 66 points that means that this is now the eighth straight opponent 
to uh, score 70 or fewer points. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I don't know how many times we're going to have to say it this year, but North Carolina's calling card is the defense. The offense is going to get theirs. They're going to do it. They're going to do what they need to do. But Carolina's defense has to continue to show up game after game after game. So if the offense is having trouble getting untracked a little bit, it doesn't matter. If you're holding a team under 70 points or at or below 70 points, I'm telling you, Carolina is going to be able to get to 70 in just about every single game this season. All right. So there we go. There's the eight things I wanted to chat about. Here's what I'd like to do now is I'm going to switch over to the chat and see what kind of questions we have that we can answer from you all. So stick with me and let's find some good questions in the chat. Mm. <laughs> Quentin Post was playing a football game. That's hilarious. Um, hey, look, this is just uh, very, I'm guessing this is Mark Schrader, Mass Words, who um, is part of our Discord. Great to see if this is Mark. He says, how awesome is Mr. Trimble? We haven't talked too much about Seth yet in this game, just a little bit here and there. Four Seth specifically scored six points, had that three we talked about earlier, um, and then also had another field goal and then the free throw. But as I said, four rebounds, one assist, and critically, zero turnovers. You need that. He was plus eight, which is second best on the team. So, I mean, he's just affecting the game in, in some really good ways. Played 15 minutes off the bench, did Seth. So yeah, Mark, it's just, Seth just keeps continuing to show up game after game after game. Um, Benjamin Swaim says, a win is a win. And here's why I want to point that out. I think it's so easy to get caught up in you know, like one of the things I said on Friday show was I'd like to see Carolina get a nice smooth road win in conference. All four of these road games that Carolina has played, they've all been road wins and that's great. But I said, I'd, I'd like it to just like get off to a hot start and then just run BC out the gym. And it wasn't that, but a, any road win is important. You've seen how many ranked teams are going on the road this year and losing and, and let's keep in mind, this is a double-digit win, 76 to 66. So, yes, Benjamin, I am right with you. This team, Will Allison says it perfectly here. Love how we win in a variety of ways. This team never gets rattled. They're fun to watch, and we should enjoy every minute of it. That is a great reminder from Will. Thank you, Will, for that great thought. Um, Nintendo, What's up, Nintendo? Uh, asks... Did James Aconquo's play today earn him more minutes? I, for one, was very impressed. Yeah, it's a good question from Nintendo. Here's my take on James Aconquo. He is going to be a contextually specific minutes getter. Maybe that's a confusing phrase. Here's what I mean. The reason he came in in the first half was because of the foul trouble to the Jalens and Armando, who had two as well. And so, you know, James even came in before Zayden High there in the first half, finishes playing eight, eight minutes total for James. Um, and it wasn't like he did a ton of things, but he had a feel, he had that dunk right before halftime. I thought that was critical for getting a little bit of Mr. Momentum heading into halftime, had three rebounds, one of which was offensive, um, had a block was, you know, positive on plus minus in this game. And so, um, and then got some minutes in the second half that weren't even necessitated by foul trouble anymore. And so Nintendo, I don't know that he's earned himself more minutes, but I think what it showed for me, not I think what it did show for me is why he's on this roster. If there, there are going to be games like this, particularly on the road when you're not getting a favorable whistle as happened in this game, where you're going to have some front court foul trouble and Okonkwo can come in. He's not going to be flashy. Things are going to happen like him missing that pass. I think it was from Harrison Ingram where he could have had a dunk. Like that's going to happen sometimes, but it, it just shows why he's on this roster. And so it's earned him more trust. I think I can definitely say that. Um, all right. Scrolling through for a few more questions here. I'm just looking for question marks. Um, Man, uh, let me just flip to another of Nintendo, Nintendo Nerds comments. I'm telling y'all, Withers being consistent is one of our keys to a deep tournament run. Yeah, you just keep seeing these guys rise up, right? Um, 
Sometimes you'll have Withers contributing. Sometimes you'll have a Conquo doing some things. Or Jalen Washington, um, who I think took a cut under his eye in this game. I, I hate that um, for Jaywash. Um, Seth contributing in these ways. And like Jay Witt now has put together multiple, and I mean more than two, multiple games where he has been really importantly impactful for the team. And so, yes, Nintendo, absolutely. And everyone in the chat after you said that is agreeing with you there. Um, <laughs> Nintendo then says later, less than ideal is one way to put it. Yeah, look, I'm trying not, I'm just out here trying not to get fined. Okay. I don't, I don't need that in my life. Uh, Michael Shadron says in re response to what I said about Cormac, uh, earlier in the show is uh, I guess that means good things for Cormac on Monday as Carolina hosts wake. And that's very important, Michael. And, and it brings up something I want to mention. This is going to be Carolina's first Saturday, Monday, back to back of the season. I think there's one more later on. It's, I forget where the Saturday game is, but then Monday Carolina hosts Miami at home. Uh, I think that's the only, the, the only other one. And if I remember correctly, it's like the 26th of February, something like that. Anyway, Carolina is so far up in, in Boston right now um, and is going to turn around, get home as quick as they can because Wake was at home today and beat Louisville. So uh, a tougher game for Carolina, an easier game for Wake. Wake was already at home and then just has to make the decently short trip to Chapel Hill while Carolina's got to fly all the way home. Um, but thankfully, it was an early-ish afternoon game, can get home, get off their feet, get some rest. And it's a great experience. I said this, I think, on Friday show. It's great experience for the NCAA tournament where you got to be ready for one day off and then play again. So now you, you've got this win. On the plane ride home, you start to flip your brain a little bit to Wake Forest and you start thinking about shutting down Hunter Salas and all these guys. And uh, so, um, Michael, I, I know you weren't saying it for that, but I wanted to make sure to bring that up as we were chatting today. Um, let's see if there's other stuff we want to get to. Um, any other questions for us here? Yeah, Will, Will Allison with a, a great point here. Another thing is how about Armando Baycott invisible in the first, but came back and went to work, played great defense. That's one thing he's really approved at along with his free throws. Yeah. Armando zero field goal attempts in the first half. BC did a nice job. Um, almost similar to how Virginia just brings those immediate double teams. Boston BC was really ready for that. Um, and, and forcing the ball out of Mondo's hands. But he's just playing in the rhythm of the It's like, all right, if that's what you're going to do, we're going to kick the ball around, move it. And then he comes back in the second half. Um, things start to, you know, how to um, and one, like right at the beginning of the first half. It was, I feel like right before he picked up that third foul, it was like, all right, Mondo's going to be able to start doing things here. Um, had a, cu a couple really nice defensive moments once he had that third foul where he walled people off, did good things there. Um, there was a play where he got switched. I, forgive me, I can't remember which BC player it was, but he was out guarding on the perimeter and forced the BC, like stayed in front well enough and the BC player settled for a mid-range jumper that missed. And it's like, that's what Mondo has to do. And yet another game at the free throw line. Mondo in this one went four of four from the free throw line. I, I haven't put in, you know, obviously because we got going on this really quick. I haven't had time to put in all my stats to see what Mondo's up to now on the season from the free throw line. But man, oh man, yes, great stuff from that. All right, let's see if we can get one more question <laughs> or two. Jeffrey Davis, I love this. Talking about RJ Davis. So RJ in this game led Carolina with 16 points. But he was only five of 14 from the field. He was only two of seven from three. That's going to bring his average down, which is hilarious. And he missed a free throw. What is funny when he missed that he was, uh, you know, Carolina's first four trips to the free throw line were literally all one of two. We talked about that four of eight start. One of those was RJ Davis. And I typed in my, my game notes at the time. Like, I hope this is not a bad omen RJ. Cause I think Carolina was down when he missed that. It's like, I hope this is not a bad omen. But as I said, RJ still, Six boards, two of which were offensive, four assists, just one turnover. Uh, didn't get any steals in this game. He's been getting a lot of steals lately, but none in this game. But you're absolutely right in saying that, Jeffrey. If RJ's off night is 16 points, okay, 
fantastic. There's your ACC player of the year. So great stuff. Great stuff. Uh, Carolina blue. Yes. Let's talk about this. How about Elliot's aggressiveness? I, I liked it and I wanted more of it. Honestly, it, it felt like in the first half, Elliot was very intentional and specific to get to the rim, finished three of seven with eight points, two of four from the free throw line, two rebounds, five assists, just two turnovers. Love to see that. He and um, RJ combined for nine assists and three turnovers. That's a three to one assist to turnover ratio. Yeah, all day long. But Elliot, man, his ability to get to the rim when he – like that one where it was just a line drive and it was like kind of threw it hard off the glass to score. Yeah, that's what Carolina needs from him. So, RJ, or excuse me, Elliot, keep, keep doing that. Very, very good there. All right, folks, I think that is probably it. Regular Degular says Ike Shade. Uh, I've been called Ike a time or two in my days. You love that. Um, so, folks – I think that's all we're going to do for today. I'm sure there's more that we could get to, uh, but we got to get out of here. We're just getting to 30 minutes. And so I want to let you go because I know it's supper time on the East Coast and uh, it's time to spend the evening with your family celebrating Carolina, staying atop the ACC standings, undefeated still. And folks, it is great stuff. So uh, excited to see what else happens in college basketball this weekend. Don't forget the ladies play tomorrow. I want to tell you, y'all, it is always a great day to be a Tar Heel. Uh, on Sunday after the ladies play, I'll go ahead and record the show. And Monday's show, by the way, is going to be more breakdown from this game. But we immediately got to turn around and do our Four Corners preview for the Wake Forest game. If you are not subscribed, please go subscribe to our show. Uh, um, just the link is down there in the corner as it always is. We'd love to have you do that. And we're coming back in getting me full screen here. So I hope you have a great rest of the weekend. We'll talk to you again on Monday to get ready for Wake Forest and break down more of this game. But until then, peace.